Good evening to all of you. A very warm welcome to the uh, first uh, of the of our series of lectures in the Munich Economic Debate. Uh, you know that these lectures are organized uh, in groups of lectures, and each of these groups uh, has a title. And we are now starting uh, a lecture group uh, lecture series entitled Germany's Economic Policy Challenges in the Post Merkel Era. And obviously, one of these challenges is economic inequality. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted, uh, together with my co-host, Bastian Brinkmann from the Süddeutsche Zeitung, I'm absolutely uh, delighted uh, that our speaker today is uh, probably the uh, best known and ideal speaker on this subject, um, not just in Europe, but in the world. Uh, it is Thomas Piketty. Uh, Thomas uh, is very well known. Let me still, still say a few words of introduction. He's a professor uh, of economics at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. Uh, he is an outstanding academic economist and researcher in many ways, but he's also an economist who uh, speaks and appeals to the general public. And uh, indeed, I don't quite remember where you said that, Thomas, but at, at somewhere you wrote, I believe, that you thought academics were spending a lot of time uh, doing very sophisticated things, but uh, things that are maybe not always as relevant as one would like them to be. And uh, your work and your books are, uh, of course, very relevant and uh, uh, speak to things many people care about, not just economist. And that um, uh, is a very good fit to our lecture series here. Germany, as other countries, is facing massive challenges in the future regarding income inequality, part, partly resulting from things preceding the COVID crisis. But the COVID crisis itself has contributed to that. Uh, in particular, disadvantaged children have been affected by school closures. Uh, we have uh, massive shifts in capital markets. Uh, and then, of course, there is the climate issue, uh, which raises not just environmental questions, but also distributional and social issues. So there are big challenges ahead. And uh, we are absolutely delighted that you agreed to give this lecture. So a very warm welcome again. And uh, we are looking forward to your presentation tomorrow. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, so thanks a lot uh, uh, for the invitation. You know, I'm very, very glad to, to be able to talk to you today, you know, especially uh, just a few days before the German election, which is, of course, very important for Germany, for Europe, and for the world. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, okay, uh, so I hope uh, that this is okay with you, that you can see this, and I hope it's also okay when I shift to this first world map, and in case you don't see a world map right now, uh, please uh, do something, let me know. Uh, well, so I, I, I assume everything is okay. So yes, yeah, so the, the, title, uh, you know, the title I gave to this short talk is Inequality in Europe and the World, so I'm, I'm going to start with uh, some perspective on inequality at the world level, and, but I will, I will quickly move to, to Europe and, and you know, Germany in some ways, but uh, Europe more generally. So le let me start with this right away, you know, the, 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 with this world map, so, so as to give you sort of a sense of, uh, you know, what, what we know and what we don't know about inequality in the world today. So on, on this map, you know, you have an indicator of inequality, income inequality, which is the share of total income going to the top 10%. Uh, and then I will show you another map, which is the share going to the bottom 50%. And of course, whatever is not in this two map goes to the group in between the top 10 and the bottom 50%. What I want you to remember uh, are just general orders of magnitude about inequality. You know, the exact numbers are, are, are not so important, but I think the orders of magnitude are important. Uh, also, I should say, you know, this world map comes from the World Inequality Database, so you can find all the data online at the uh, website uh, wid.world and this comes from a you know huge uh, collective uh, project of uh, data gathering uh, putting together uh, you know over uh, 70 uh, scholars uh, from all around the world and the novelty uh, of what we've been doing with the world inequality database is to combine 
both household survey, but also fiscal data, national accounts, so as to have sort of plausible estimates of the distribution of the full national income as measured by national accounts. Because if you only use household survey, you typically underestimate uh, uh, both labor income and most importantly capital income going to top income groups, and you don't have a very accurate view of the, of the total distribution of output and national income. And so we've, we've made a lot of effort at the World Inequality Lab in Paris and Berkeley and with, with uh, you know, participants from all over the world to, to get to a better picture of world inequality. And you know, I think we still have a lot of progress to make. You know, I, I think there's too little transparency about uh, income and, and especially wealth data around the world. But at least I think you know, we, this is a bit better than what we used to do. So what do we learn from this map and the following world map I will show? Probably the first important message I want you to remember is that distribution uh, matters a lot because you have lots of variation in terms of inequality. So if we look here at the share of national income going to the top 10 percent, so by definition, if we had complete equality, it should be 10 percent, you know, the, because it's 10 percent of the population, so they should have 10 percent of total income. If we had complete inequality, they should have 100 percent of, of total income. Now, in the real world, of course, it's always in between uh, 10 and 100. But in practice, it goes from, uh, so it doesn't go from 10 to 100, but it goes to from, say, 20 to 70, if I want. You know, so the most equal country in the world, say, Sweden or Norway, will be around 20, well, actually, maybe more 25, 30. It used to be maybe close to between 20 and 25 in the early 1980s. Now it's more, say, 25, 30. And the most unequal country in the world, you know, say, South Africa, will be, will be close to, uh, to 70. So, that, so this varies quite a lot. You know, from 20 to 70, it's a, it's a, it's a huge variation. Uh, if you look at the following uh, uh, figure, which is the bottom 50%, which you should now see on your screen. And again, if, if you don't see it, uh, you know, please tell me so that I know uh, 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 that I need to change something. But so here on this world map, you now have the share of total income going to the bottom 50%. So again, the orders of magnitude are interesting, which is that, uh, okay, so if we had complete equality, Again, the bottom 50% should get 50% of total income because there are 50% of the population. If you had complete inequality, they should get 0%. In the real world, it goes from uh, 5% to up to 20, 25%. So again, the most equal country in the world, in, especially in, in Northern Europe, would be 20, 25%. And the most unequal country, it will be uh, 5% in, uh, in, uh, in uh, South Africa or in, in Mexico or in Brazil. It will be, well, you know, between 5 to 10, uh, between 5 and 10, and, and in some cases closer uh, than 5. The, the, so the first thing I would like you to remember from this is that the distribution of national income uh, matters a lot when we want to evaluate, uh, you know, poverty or, you know, in general, the welfare of the population. Because... If the, if the bottom 50% share varies from a factor of one to five, say from, from five to 25% of total income, you know, this means uh, uh, in a very concrete manner that for, for the same average income, you know, for the same uh, GDP per capita, uh, depending on the level of inequality in the country, in fact, the average income of the bottom 50% can vary from a factor of one to five. Okay, so it's not just, small details, you know, it, it, it can have, it can completely change the picture as compared to aggregate GDP. So if you only have aggregate GDP or aggregate national income, which as you may know, is a better indicator already of economic welfare than GDP, because at least with national income, in principle, you, you take away uh, capital depreciation, including in principle the depreciation of natural capital. You take away uh, the outflow of, of uh, the net outflow of capital income and labor income going to other countries. So national income, by and large, is a better indicator of a country's welfare than GDP. But still, if you only look at aggregate national income, you're going to miss a lot because, uh, as I just explained, you know the share going to the bottom 50 percent, you know, can vary enormously. So this is why when we talk about world development uh, and we talk about you know, economic development in general, we really need 
to get away from, from very crude indicator like GDP or even aggregate national income and, and study also uh, uh, inequality uh, because otherwise we, you know, we, we don't have the, uh, just uh, the right indicator to evaluate what's going on to, to the majority of the population or to a very large segment of the population. I will also argue a bit later in this presentation that environmental uh, indicators obviously need to be put into the picture and at the center of the picture together with inequality uh, indicators. We really need uh, this sort of multidimensional set of economic indicators if we want to be able to, to properly uh, evaluate what's happening and to organize a democratic uh, uh, conversation about policy objective and, and policy uh, choices. So that was a, sort of the first general point I wanted to make the importance of this inequality indicator. Now, the second point I would like to make, moving uh, toward Europe and, 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 and in particular to Germany and France and you know, countries in Western Europe, is that, uh, okay, if you look at this world map, you know, it will be tempting to say, uh, okay, after all, you know, uh, uh, equality is quite important in Europe as compared to other countries. Inequality is much smaller in Europe than in uh, other parts of the world. So, you know, why are people complaining? Why should we care about inequality? Uh, we, we are so equal, uh, people should just stop complaining and be happy. I think this is not the right strategy. I think, you know, telling European citizens or, you know, citizens in Germany and France that, you know, they should be very happy because inequality in Europe is uh, less than uh, in South Africa or less than in Brazil or less than in the US or less than in India is not is not a very strong argument because you know most European citizens actually are very well aware that you know, Europe is uh, less unequal than these, these other regions of the world, which which are extremely unequal. But you know that doesn't mean you know we, we know that Europe has built a welfare state in the 20th century that has made the continent relatively more equal than than you know Brazil or or South Africa. You know this doesn't come as a surprise, and so. Telling people, uh, you know, you should you should just be happy with what you have, uh, and you know you have to accept the fact that there's only you know one set of uh, economic or social policies in today's globalization, and uh, and maybe we need, sometimes people go even as far as saying you know we should go in the direction of sort of the U.S. or or Brazil or India level of inequality. You know, I think this is the kind of discourse which sometimes people would follow this discourse also are people at the, who are at the top of the distribution and maybe would like in Europe to get a bigger share of the pie uh, and so they try to find an argument to make people accept uh, policy reform going in this direction. You know, I think this is exactly the recipe to make the citizens of Europe uh, hate globalization, uh, hate uh, uh, the world economy as it works. So, I, you know, I think, uh, okay, inequality in Europe is less extreme as in other parts of the world, but that doesn't mean, you know, we should be satisfied with this, because as I'm going to argue in the rest of the talk, uh, inequality is still very large by, uh, by, by absolute standards in Europe. It's less extreme than Brazil, South Africa, that's for sure. But still, it's, it's extremely large. And there are many challenges uh, ahead in terms of uh, raising inequality equality in access to education, uh, uh, reducing uh, gaps in income and wealth in order to be able to, uh, uh, to address uh, uh, our, uh, our climate and environmental uh, challenges. So, so, you know, that's, I think we should take this issue seriously. And, and, and uh, you know, of course, it's an even bigger issue in some other parts of the world, but that doesn't mean that Europe should not take this uh, issue uh, seriously. So I'm, I'm going to start by, by, uh, you know, by stressing one of the uh, limitations, if, in, 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 if you wish, the rise of equality in Europe, uh, which is uh, about the concentration of wealth as compared to the concentration of income. Then I will move to uh, the issue of uh, uh, equality in access to education, and then I will conclude with, with uh, uh, environmental uh, inequality. So let me start with, with wealth. So what I have shown you on this map is the distribution of income. So income is what you earn during a given year. It can be your wage income, your labor income, it can be your capital income, it can be your pension income. So it's a mixture of all of this. And the basic orders of magnitude in, in Europe today is that the top 10% would have you know, 25 
to 30 or actually 35 percent of total income in, 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 in most countries and the bottom 50 percent would have say 20 percent of, of total uh, income uh, uh, so that's the kind of level of inequality that, that we have in terms of income now when it comes to wealth uh, in fact the inequality of wealth is much bigger than this and that's the first point i would like to 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 stress is the idea of a persistence of hyper concentrated wealth so here i have shown you uh, uh, the distribution of wealth so here the distribution for europe is the average of uh, the number of european countries in particular uh, Britain, France, Sweden, which are some of the countries for which we had historical studies uh, going back to the 19th century or sometimes even 18th century uh, for a long time. In fact, there's been some recent study for Germany uh, by, uh, by Charlotte Bartels and Moritz Schularik and maybe some other people that I forgot, which find very similar uh, orders of magnitude for Germany both today and in the long run. Uh, so, so you can take this number that I show to you as in Europe as representative of Western Europe in general and in particular uh, Germany. So what you can see is that uh, uh, you know the inequality of wealth is much bigger than that of income. So if you take the average for Europe today, well here these are numbers for 2018 and and that uh, you know similar today. I mean probably today the share going to the very top has increased a little bit after the COVID, but you know the orders of magnitude are roughly the same. So the share going to the bottom 50%, you know, I want to stress the, the bottom part of the distribution, is around 5% of, of total wealth. So remember what we had for income, it was about 20% of, uh, uh, of total income going to the bottom 50%. So you know, this illustrates how the inequality of wealth is much bigger. So basically, the bottom 50% has very, has very little uh, wealth, and the top 10% alone has typically between 50 and 60% of total wealth today in Europe. Now, one century ago, you know, on the eve of World War I, it was even more concentrated. So at that time, you know, the top 10% would have between 80 and 90% of total wealth. Uh, the bottom 50% would have, uh, you know, one or two percent instead of five or six today. And the, the, the next 40%, you know, which is sort of this group that is intermediate between the bottom 50 and the top 10, had, uh, you know, roughly 10%. So of course, the, 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 this next 40% by definition were a bit richer than the bottom 50%. They've always been a bit richer, but they were not that much richer in 1930. Whereas today, and that's probably the most important transformation uh, in Europe uh, uh, over the past uh, century, you have you know, a significant share of, of total wealth going to this uh, intermediate 40%, you know, this sort of middle 40% group, although they are not exactly in the middle because they are in between the bottom 50 and the top 10. And, and so today, you know, this group would have about 40% of total wealth, which you know, given that they are 40% of the population, means that on average, they have the average wealth, which will be maybe around, uh, you know, 200,000 euros uh, per adult today in, in, uh, in, in France or Germany. So this will be groups of people who would have between, one, you know, 100,000 euros, 200, 300, 400. So typically, uh, uh, you know, this is a group I refer to in my work as the patrimonial middle class which is a group that, you know, did not exist a century ago and, and today, you know, as, as, a, as a significant share of total wealth. So that's, a, you know, important uh, evolution. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the bottom 50% still uh, owns uh, very little. So, you know, there's been a move toward more equality, including for the distribution of wealth, but this move has been fairly limited. Uh, you can see the United States on the right, which is sort of intermediate between Europe today and Europe a century ago, and which is sort of moving slowly in the direction of Europe a century ago in the sense that the share uh, going to the middle 40% has been uh, declining quite steeply in the US over the past 30 years. You know, it used to be close to the European level around 1980, and, and now it's, it's going down gradually, uh, which I think, you know, this decline of the, of the patrimonial middle class in the US is one of the key factors that sort of, uh, that's creating a lot of uh, political turmoil uh, in, the, in the United States. You know, some people like Trump have tried to blame globalization, Mexico, China. 
some people are, are, have, have, have started to blame you know, lack of investment in public infrastructure, public education, which I think is a more uh, reasonable analysis. But you know, in any case, you know, this, this, this is, this is a, an evolution that has created a lot of turmoil. So if, if we look at the time evolution, so you know, this is uh, the rise of the patrimonial middle class. So this is in the case of France, for which we have a lot of historical series and data sources going back to the French Revolution. But again, uh, the, you, the numbers for Germany are very comparable from the study of, uh, of uh, Charlotte Bartel and Maurice Schulerich. So, so you, know, you, you know, the orders of magnitude, uh, you, you, can, you can take them as given. So, so what this figure illustrates, again, is that in the long run, we have an increase in the share of the, of the middle 40%, but the bottom 50%, you know, it's, uh, they have 6% of total wealth today. Uh, one century ago, in the 19th century, it was 2%. So, you know, it's an improvement, but it's, uh, you know, it's a very modest uh, improvement. And, you know, the view that we should just wait for growth uh, and market competition you know, to spread the wealth, uh, you know, it's a very tempting uh, view, of course, because then you don't need to do anything. Uh, the problem is that if that was sufficient, uh, you know, we should have seen something a bit more spectacular over the past two centuries, because there's been a lot of growth, there's been a lot of market competition, but in the end, the share going to the bottom 50% did not increase very much. Uh, in, in the recent decade, the share going to the middle 40% has started to decline a little bit in France, more strongly in Germany, according to the Schularek Bartels series, but, but in any case, you know, this is not going really in the direction of spreading the wealth more towards the, the bottom uh, the bottom 50 percent which I think is a is a pity not only in terms of equity uh, but also in terms of um, of economic efficiency because you know there are lots of uh, uh, people who are uh, poor uh, who have very little wealth you know in particular in uh, you know this also means that the distribution of inheritance is very strongly concentrated you know the bottom 50 percent of children will inherit uh, close to zero uh, and, and the top 10 percent or top one percent of children will inherit a lot and you know i think it's not very good in terms of economic efficiency economic openness because uh, uh, you know, lots of lots of people of course in the in the uh, bottom groups you know would you know uh, have a lot lots of ideas to create companies or to develop various projects and and this huge inequality of opportunity uh, is is uh, is not is not a, a very good uh, very good situation so you know i think it's a serious issue you know of europe in the long run has made progress in terms of distribution of income there is still you know, a lot of inequality of income, but it, uh, you know, Europe has made some progress in terms of inequality of income. For inequality of wealth, you know, the progress has been uh, more uh, more limited, and you know, I think it's a, it's an important issue for the future. So uh, this is so on this graph, you have the shares going to top ten, uh, bottom fifty, and, and middle forty. Uh, it's 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 quite spectacular also when you compare the share going to top one percent and bottom fifty. You can see, you know, the big decline in the the share going to top one percent between World War One and the and the 1980s. Uh, that you would have roughly the same timing in the case of Germany. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, the bottom 50 percent, you know, I, I did not really benefit from that. And even today, uh, you know, they own uh, uh, much much less than the top one percent, in spite of the fact that the bottom 50 percent collectively. Uh, is 50 times more numerous than the top 1%. Let, let me also mention to conclude this discussion about inequality of wealth, that you would have roughly the same uh, order of magnitude if you were to look at inequality within uh, uh, age group. So if you look only at people uh, age 20 to 35 or 35 to 50 or 50 to 65 or above 65, you would have roughly the same order of magnitude. So this is not, you know, this very large inequality of wealth, either on, on this uh, graph or on the previous graph, is not an artifact due to the life cycle of wealth. So it's not that the people at the bottom are young people who are about to become rich and who will jump in, in the middle 40%. 
of course, average wealth rises with age, that's fairly obvious, but within each age group, you have a lot of inequality and you have roughly the same orders for the top 10, middle 40, and bottom 50% uh, share. In particular, in every age group, whether the very old or the very young or the middle age, the share going to the uh, bottom 50% will always be less than 10% in every, uh, you know, for every time period and country for which we have uh, data. Now, let me come to another issue, which is the, the, uh, uh, the question of, of uh, social uh, state, social spending, and in particular, education and the problem of equality in access to education. So first of all, if you look in the very long run, uh, you know, the rise of the social state in Europe, and so here this is an average of Germany, uh, Britain, France, and Sweden. So, you know, you have variation between this, this, the different countries, but by and large, this is the, the, the general pattern. The, the paradox, so, so some of this evolution is very well known, and you know, everybody knows about the rise of the social state in the long run. Uh, the only point that I would like to stress here, uh, and you know, we can return to other aspects of this figure in the questions if you, if you want, but the one aspect I want to stress here is the, the uh, evolution of education spending. So as you can see, you know, edu so education spending before World War I in the 19th century was very small. You know, uh, well, social spending in general was very small, you know, between 1% and 2% of national income uh, before World War I, all social spendings put together. And education alone, you know, it was, in, it was less than 0.5% of national income in, in, uh, in European countries before World War I. In, in, uh, in, in the US, it was actually close to 1% of national income income already in 1913, so in the US were ahead, and, and Germany was in relative terms higher than, a bit higher than France, and France a bit higher than Britain, so, you know, within uh, European countries, there, there were differences which, uh, which, which, you know, made a difference for, for you know, the skills of in the manufacturing sector and productivity, but by and large, total education spending, you know, was fairly small everywhere. You know, say less than 0.5 percent of national income in Europe and less than one percent of national income in the U.S. Now, today, educational spending is much bigger. You know, it's like six percent of national income, typically. You know, say between five and seven, you know, depending on the country you look at. But in all developed countries, you know, you have. Uh, uh, around 5 to 7% of national income, on average about 6% of national income in Western Europe. So as compared to the 0.5% of national income going to education a century ago, you know, this has been, um, this has been multiplied by 10. And, you know, I think this uh, enormous investment in education has been uh, historically the, the primary uh, driving force, uh, not only for, for uh, the rise of equality, you know, the fact that, you know, in a century ago, our educational system were extremely hierarchical with, uh, you know, the, most of the population would only go to primary school and, 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 and only a very small elite would go to higher education uh, with 6% of national income. This was, uh, you know, this is what made possible to pay for uh, an extension of, of the, uh, an enormous expansion of the educational system with, uh, with a, 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 a large majority of a generation going to secondary school and now a very large fraction of the population going to, to uh, university and higher education. Now, the problem, and I want to stress now this paradox, is that as you can see on this graph, uh, the, 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 you observe, you have, you have a stagnation of total educational investment around 6% of national income, basically since the 1980s, 1990s, which is in a way very paradoxical because uh, the, 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 the fraction of a generation going to higher education has continued uh, to increase a lot over this period. So if you have more and more students, but you, you, know, you don't have more resources, uh, you know, so, so, some, some students are, are not going to receive the investment that, that we you know, be, believe they should, uh, they should receive. And, 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 and what this leads to, I think, well, first of all, that's probably one of the key factors for the decline of economic growth in recent decades. You know, I think if you, you know, in any model of economic growth, if you, if you have a stagnation in human capital investment as compared to a huge expansion in the previous uh, decades, uh, you know, that's probably not very good for, for uh, the, the, the rate of uh, innovation and productivity growth. And this has also come with increased 
inequality and stratification within the higher education uh, system. So one particularly extreme example is the US, uh, where, you know, if you saw on this graph, you know, this is research by my uh, colleagues, uh, Emmanuel Saez and Raj Shetty in the United States, where you see you plot parental income, percentile of parental income on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis, you have the probability to go to university. And, you know, as you can see, this is almost a straight line, and this is almost the, the, the 45 degree line. So you go almost from zero to 100% probability to go to university, uh, depending on your parental income. So not quite, you know, if, you're, uh, if your parents are very poor in the bottom 10%, you still have a 25% uh, chance to go to university. And if your parents are very rich, you know, in the top 10%, you only have a 95% chance to go to university. So it's not exactly the 45 degree line, but, you know, it's, it's, it's close to this. And, and really, you know, this shows, you know, sometimes there's really a huge gap between the theoretical discourse about meritocracy, uh, equal opportunity, et cetera, et cetera, and the reality of how, uh, how our societies are working. So I think it's very important uh, that we have more transparency, not only about the inequality of income and wealth, but also about how uh, you know, public spending is benefiting or not uh, different uh, groups. Now, in the case of the US, it's even worse than that, because of course, when you uh, are able to go to university with uh, poor parents, on average, you, know, you don't go at all to the same universities and if you have rich parents, so the inequality in spending is even bigger than this inequality in rate of access to higher education. But what I want to stress is that, you know, it, again, it will be too simple for people in Europe, you know, to say, oh, okay, this is the US, you know, it's a very unequal country, it's, it's based on very high uh, tuition fees for universities, whereas in Germany or France or Sweden, we have, a, you don't have to pay to go to higher education, or you have to pay very, relatively little in the case of France. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, you know, we don't have this problem in uh, inequality in, in access to, to education. I think this will be a mistake. So if you look, you know, in the case of France, uh, so here I have uh, compared, you know, different historical period about the distribution of educational spending. Uh, so if you look at France 2018, you know, it looks more equal than France 1910, and both look a lot more equal than I, I've taken the example of a colonial society, which was Algeria in 1950, where basically uh, more than 80% of the educa total educational spending will go to 10% of the population, which were the, the children of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of settlers, uh, the children of Europeans. Uh, so, yeah, you know, that's a very extreme case, and, you know, this corresponds to, uh, to a completely segregated uh, educational system, in, you know, uh, in, in a way that was in some in some ways even worse than the, the, the system of segregation in the US South uh, uh, until the 1960s. Uh, well, you, you know, comparable in some ways, more extreme in some ways if you actually, if you look at the inequality of, of budgetary resources that were invested in the different schools. But what I want to stress is, okay, as compared, of course, to a, a segregated society, or even as compared to France 1910, Today, uh, after all, the, the total educational investment received by the top 10% of a generation is only, uh, you know, 20%, you know, as compared to uh, 35% for the bottom 50%. So you could say, oh, this is relatively equal. Well, except that the top 10% is five times less numerous than the bottom 50%. So the fact that they receive uh, you know, uh, less, uh, you know, about uh, twice as less, or in fact, more than twice as less, means that per student, they actually receive a lot more resources. So uh, this is again an example like for the concentration of wealth where, you know, there is a movement toward equality, but, you know, we are really starting from very low. We are starting, well, or from very high in terms of inequality. So we are starting from uh, societies, you know, a century ago or two centuries ago, which were indeed even more unequal, but, you know, that's not a reason to, to, to be satisfied with this situation. Because if you look at the actual numbers behind uh, uh, these figures for France 2018, this is what you get. So here on this graph, you know, I plot uh, 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 children within a given cohort 
uh, in terms of percentile of the distribution of total educational investment received. So this is not exactly like for the US uh, percentile of parental income. Here I look at the, so the, like the top 10% here will be the children in France who will go to the, uh, typically to the uh, system of grande école and preparatory classes to grande école who would receive quite a lot of public uh, uh, investment in their higher education and they will get So you can see on this graph, they will get between 200, 250, or even 300,000 euros in terms of total public educational investment from uh, you know, kindergarten, primary school, secondary school to higher education. People at the very bottom will be the people who actually uh, don't go to higher education, you know, leave school at 16 or 17. Uh, and people in the middle will be people who go to the standard uh, university tracks, which in France get much less public uh, resources than people at the top. So as you see in the end, the total public investment uh, uh, in, in for children in the top 10% is going to be, you know, three times, four times bigger than the, than the public investment for people in the bottom 20 or 30 percent. Now, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, people uh, uh, in, in the top 10 percent or 20 percent of educational investment typically come from a more socially advantaged uh, uh, parental groups and people in the bottom of this graph. So in effect, public uh, spending is, is making, uh, is sort of exacerbating the issue inequality. Now, I don't have the same graph for Germany, and it could be, it's, it's probably likely that it's not as bad in Germany in the sense that the higher education system in Germany is less heavily stratified than the system in France with Grand École University. But that, you know, that doesn't mean that you have perfect equality in Germany, and I think what this means in general is that we need to pay a lot of attention to, uh, you know, actual, real, equality in access to education. And you know, even if we don't get to complete equality, you know, which will be the horizontal line on this graph, I think it's important to set some target. You know, are we happy? What, first, what is the current situation in terms of public resources? Uh, uh, what is the target? You know, where do we want to go? And we should monitor you know, uh, the step to where, uh, depending on where we, we want to go. Behind this graph, there's also a lot of inequality within the primary school and secondary school system, where sometimes you know, the more disadvantaged uh, high school or primary school get uh, less experienced teachers, uh, more contract teachers than more privileged uh, uh, schools, which again goes uh, you know, in the opposite direction to what we would like. Let me uh, conclude with uh, 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 two points. First point, you know, we also need, it's very important, you know, that we bring into the picture the issue of environmental inequality uh, together with, you know, inequality of income, inequality of wealth, inequality of education, which are the main dimensions of inequality I've been uh, speaking about so far. But, you know, in terms of uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, degradation and evolution, and in particular carbon emissions, Uh, I think uh, we will never be able to address seriously, uh, you know, our environmental challenge and in particular the climate challenge if we don't take uh, into account, uh, you know, inequality in carbon emissions and also inequality in terms of, you know, who's going to suffer from, from global warming. So on this graph, you know, what I've shown you is how the global distribution of carbon emission is affected by looking just at the average emission by country or looking at very high individual emissions. So basically, if you look at the top 1% uh, uh, emissions of carbon in the world, so the top 1% citizen of the world who have the highest level of carbon emission, uh, uh, you will see that you know, most of them are in, a big part of them are in North America, actually in the United States, Uh, uh, some of them also in Europe, much less in, in China, some of them in the rest of the world. So wh why is, So it's a very different picture than if you look at aggregate uh, carbon emissions. Why is this important to take this into account? Well, because uh, at the same time, I mean, what you don't have on this figure, but what we have uh, computed with uh, Lucas Chancel at the World Inequality Lab, and actually we are going to put online in a few weeks Uh, 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 complete uh, country level and regional level and world level distributions of carbon emissions and, and we will do that uh, we will update this series uh, annually uh, on the world inequality database website what we've computed with Lucas Chancel is that the 
top 1% emissions, so the, the people in the world who are in the top 1% of carbon emitters, uh, have a total carbon emissions uh, which are uh, larger than the bottom 50% Uh, carbon emitters, you know, who are typically people in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia who are going to suffer the most from the, the emissions of the, of the top 1%, mostly in, in, in the North. So if we, if we are trying to address this problem with uh, policy tools like, uh, you know, proportional carbon tax, uh, eating all income groups Similarly, you know, whether you're in the bottom 50%, the top 1%, whether you're in the north, in the south, that's not going to work. And you're going to get into big uh, uh, tax revolt like what we've seen in France with the Yellow Vest movement two years ago. So you need to construct, you know, some sense of justice where, okay, everybody is going to have to make an effort, you know, not only the top 1%, but you, you have to ask a much bigger effort proportionally to the top 1%, top 10%, if you want to convince people in the middle and people in the bottom to also uh, change their living standards. So the issue of reduction of, of inequality uh, is, is absolutely central if we want to have any successful uh, climate strategy. Let me stop by say, you know, concluding one word about Europe. So here I show you a, a, a screenshot of a website, you know, the Manifesto for the Democratization of Europe, which some of you may know, or many of you probably don't know, where this is the manifesto that we've uh, put together with a number of academics uh, from uh, quite a few from Germany, uh, from France, from Italy, from Spain. So you see we have over 117 signatures from all across uh, Europe, which is not so much, you know, given the size of Europe, of course, but it's already something where basically what we are due in this manifesto is that, you know, if we are not able Uh, to have a more integrated uh, decision-making process, majority rule decision-making process over, uh, you know, carbon taxation, the taxation of multinationals, the taxation of, you know, high wealth, high income individuals. If we continue with uh, just tax competition between countries and environmental dumping and fiscal dumping, uh, we are not going to be able to solve these issues. And so we, what we basically advocate in this manifesto is, is typically that a smaller group of countries you know, within the European Union, including Germany and France and uh, possibly Italy and Spain and Belgium and other core countries who want to move ahead, you know, should, uh, should uh, develop uh, their own, uh, you know, policy tools and, and institutions uh, uh, in order to, to move in this direction and hopefully, you know, of course, convince the rest of the European Union to join This, uh, this, uh, this movement as soon as possible. But if we, if we want to do uh, everything with 27 countries right away, uh, this might be uh, the best recipe uh, not to do very much. So that's uh, my final word for this uh, initial presentation. And of course, I will be very glad to, to answer questions about any part of the material I've shown you, in particular the, the last one. On, And, and Europe, but uh, any other part which may be of interest to you. Thanks a lot for your attention. Bastian, would you like to get us started? There are a lot of questions in the chat, uh, and I have questions, and I'm sure you have questions, Bastian. Yeah, traditionally, hello, welcome also from me. Good evening, thanks for the talk. Uh, traditionally, the first question is asked by Mr. Fust, and I won't take away this traditional right from him tonight. So please go ahead and everybody else, you can use the question answer section at the bottom to fill in your question and we'll get to that. Yes, thank you, Bastian. That sounds very hierarchical and very undemocratic, but uh, let me still just to, you know, uh, break the ice, uh, get the discussion going. So uh, what I, you know, I, I think various things I found very fascinating in particular and, and new really, in particular your last point about Uh, inequality issues raised by climate change. Now, this is very serious. I, and I do think, you mentioned that, I do think that uh, the Yellow Vest uh, protests were sobering in the sense that a lot of people, including most economists, had counted very much on the CO2 price. Uh, and uh, now we are faced with this opposition. So I, I would be in interested, What's uh, what would be your recipe if you have one? So how can... Uh, so, so what you mentioned, if I understand you correctly, is 
um, the fact that rich people um, do more emissions, cause more emissions because they have more cars, they have bigger houses and so on, they travel more. So that's one side of the coin, but then uh, also obviously a CO2 price is a proportional tax and it is a, it, it, it places a bigger burden on low incomes, uh, on people living in rural areas. So there's this, this geographic dimension. Uh, is it would it, be, would it be possible to sketch kind of sketch a policy approach? So is it are we misguided by focusing on the CO2 price, or do we is is the price good and we should have compensation instruments? How, how what would you recommend? Yeah, I'm I'm not sure compensation is going to be uh, enough. It's going to be sufficient. But le let me say that of course you know with compensation, uh, things would have, uh, would have been much easier. So the biggest mistake you know, that was made in France in 2017, 2018, is that in fact, the new tax revenue that was going to be raised out of, uh, of energy uh, taxation was not used to invest in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the environment, in new uh, other modes of transportation, uh, compensation for the, for the poorest individual, you know, less than 20% of the tax revenue that was going to be raised uh, uh, through, uh, through carbon taxation was used for this purpose. And at the same time, you know, in 2017, 2018, as you may have heard, you know, one of the most uh, spectacular decisions of the government in France was the repeal of the uh, wealth tax, uh, which is a you know, policy which uh, center right-wing government had, had tried to do many times in the recent decades and finally had sort of abandoned doing it. And, and the government decided to do that. And in effect, uh, the, the, you know, the, in 2018, you had 5 billion euro in additional tax revenue that was entering the public coffers in terms of uh, uh, energy taxation. And the same year, you had 5 billion euro getting out for, for the wealth tax, uh, uh, wealth tax repeal. And, and you know, so the government you know, tried to say, oh, but this has nothing to do. You know, these two 5 billion euro have nothing to do with one another. Um, uh, and, and we're raising energy tax in the name of the climate, and we only care about the climate. And but you know, then people in the street, uh, you know, usually people don't always understand what's going on in terms of tax policy. But here, this was really a case where things were pretty clear. You know, the, the, at the beginning of this uh, uh, quinquennat, uh, this five-year period in France, you know, the government was. Uh, uh, sort of very uh, clear about uh, yes, you know we're going to reduce tax on uh, you know wealthy entrepreneur. We're going to make pay uh, you know everybody in terms of energy tax, and people uh, you know people got crazy. So what would have happened with a different approach? You know, using all of the tax revenue to pay for compensation, to pay for investment in a new uh, 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 you know public transportation system, whatever, is difficult to say. You know, I think. You know, I think the, the energy taxation was already in, raised, raised in France in the previous five years or actually previous 10 years, and it was sort of working. You know, people, it's not that people were happy about it, but it was sort of accepted. And I think, you know, what, in effect, what this government has, has done is to, is to kill uh, this kind of approach, at least for a long time uh, 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 in France. So, you know, the other government maybe will try with, uh, with compensation, but, you know, that's going to be very difficult. So I think, you know, I don't have the perfect recipe, but I think it's worth thinking about uh, an approach to carbon taxation, which will be more explicitly uh, progressive and which will make a difference, you know, between different groups of the population. So in, in, in principle, you know, you could think of many other ways, you know, it's like the income tax or the inheritance tax, you know, it can be proportional or it can be progressive. And so carbon tax in principle, you know, you can have, you can think of a system where you have an individual carbon cart where, which is already what we have a little bit for electricity consumption or gas consumption some, or water consumption in some places where in effect you don't treat in the same way, you know, the first, uh, five uh, ton of carbon emission and, and people who already uh, emit, uh, you know, 20 or 50 or 60 ton per year of carbon emission, where the tax rate becomes, uh, uh, becomes really uh, uh, very, very, very high. Uh, I, I think we will have to get there at some point. I, I, you know, I don't see a solution to, to carbon taxation, carbon pricing uh, that would, uh, given, given how enormous you know, we need to, you know, the, the reduction in, in total carbon emissions that we need to have. 
well, first, we, as we all know, this, this will also involve major change in norms, you know, change in, uh, you know, just what you are allowed to do or not to do in terms of uh, uh, car engine, uh, uh, construction standards for buildings. So, you know, it's not all um, um, uh, a question of taxation and, and, and carbon price, but for the, for the parts that will have to be taken, uh, taken uh, uh, you know, addressed by, by carbon price and, and carbon tax, you know, I think we will we will need to move to this kind of progressive carbon card system in the... No, it's not going to be simple. It will take a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't see any other solution that will sort of uh, make this socially acceptable. Yeah, well, one follow-up question regarding the German debate at the moment. Uh, so in Germany, there is this debate about the CO2 price and the revenue, as you just described. And then, then there is the idea around to use revenue for a lump sum transfer to everybody. It's called the climate premium. Now, um, uh, I mean, you, what you are saying, if I understand it correctly, is let's give it a progressive notion. So what would you think, for instance, about saying, okay, it's not going to be a lump sum transfer, it's going to be progressive. So let's give it to the bottom 50% and tell the top 50% no. Uh, do, you, do you think that would uh, threaten to make it too unpopular to the top 50? Or what do you think about that policy? Yeah, you know, I think potentially that could be one way to go. But what I had in mind with the carbon cart was also that the tax rate itself, you know, will vary with the level of emission. So, so, mm -hmm. for, so for instance, you know, if, we, if, if you look at the distribution of carbon emissions in a, in, in a country like Germany or France today, if you look at the bottom 50% of the population who have the lowest carbon emission, you know, their average carbon emission right now uh, is uh, you know I think around you know between four and five uh, ton, which in, in effect is already in line with uh, what should be the you know average target for 2030 or even 2035 or 2040. You know the problem are the people who emit uh, 20 or 30 or 40. So you know one possible approach would be to say well look uh, people who are already sort of in line with uh, with the target. Uh, well, should not be the target of the policy. And, and uh, people who emit uh, five times or 10 times the target uh, should be the target. You know, I, you know, I know that's difficult, but uh, otherwise it's, it's, um, it's sort of strange, you know, this idea that we want a proportional reduction in everyone's carbon emission, irrespective of whether you emit three tons or 30 tons, I don't know. You know, it's uh, norms of justice are complicated, and mm -hmm. I don't claim I have the perfect recipe. But when you say it like this, when you describe it like this, you know, it's not obvious to me that you know the proportional reduction system. So I, of course, I know the economic efficiency argument, which is to say, oh, but if we trade, uh, mm -hmm. you know, rights to pollute, it's actually better to have a single price. I, I know this. Uh, that's a very nice theoretical argument. But you know, the problem is that in, in practice, the compensation. You know the first best compensation in the economic model, etc., never never come, and so this this argument looks like very often looks like an argument which is a, sort of a, a very favorable to some groups uh, and and less favorable to some other groups in the in the in the bottom part of the population. So uh, yeah, I think we have to we'll have to move to a more explicit system of graduated tax in effect on carbon emissions. You know, at, at some level, it could just be, uh, okay, you all have, uh, you know, six tons of carbon to emit, and now uh, you know, that's it, you know, and, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll see. That, that's fascinating. Uh, we could go on, but over to you, Bastian, now I will shut up. <laughs> Those were actually two good questions and also partly from the audience. So you did partly my job, but now I can continue. First, a little bit of housekeeping because somebody from the audience asked if you could provide the slides and maybe we can then upload them on the E4 website, if that's okay for you. Sure, sure. Then we will try to arrange that. And I know from experience that everything's on your website, every chart and all the data that everybody wants to have a look at. It's quite a lot to dig in, but everything is there. I can tell from own experience. Yes, yes. All the, yeah, all the series for all the figures I've shown are available online and everybody can access them. Yes. Maybe one question again for the German 
perspective, what's your take on the German election? I know it's probably very hard, even for us Germans, we don't know which coalition will be governing after the election next Sunday. But what's your view from Paris on this? That's a difficult question. You know, I don't want to look uh, rude with anyone. And I don't want, you know, I, look, I'm not voting in Germany, as you know. I don't, I've not been following uh, as well as you have the, the TV debate. So, you know, I, but le let me simply take, you know, a European perspective, or at least, you know, French European perspective on this. I think we need, uh, as I was saying, you know, in the last slide of my presentation, I think we, we move, we need to move in the direction of more integrated uh, uh, Europe in terms of uh, climate policy, uh, fiscal policy, environmental policy, uh, higher education. And for this, uh, you know, I think we, we, we need Germany and, and France and, and, uh, and other countries uh, who are ready to join, you know, join you know some kind of, of system where we can take uh, a majority rule decision at least for certain economic policy projects. You know, I'm not saying the entire uh, tax system, the entire economic policy is going to be done by a joint uh, parliament between, uh, between, uh, between uh, Germany and France and other countries, but I think we need to move in this direction because if we are always uh, uh, stuck with the uh, you know, unanimity rule system, you know, what we've seen in 2020, is that this is again once again you know we've seen that this is far too uh, far too rigid you know it took so long you know for for the 27 countries to agree on the recovery plan and you know if we have some new problem we need to solve in a few months you know what are we going to do you know are we going to wait for another uh, you know unanimity decisions to to happen and if you think of big topics like you know the discussion we've had about the taxation of multinationals you know in 20 Uh, uh, 21 and, and you know with the Biden administration sort of trying to to push a little bit more at least more than the Trump administration in the direction of more uh, uh, cooperation at the at the international level. I think we need uh, 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 Europe or at least a subset of countries within Europe, uh, uh, you know, starting with with Germany and France, you know, to be able to adopt a common uh, decision regarding uh, you know, the taxation of multinational, taxation of large companies. So in my view, you know, the right uh, institutional uh, system you know, will be um, uh, something like the, you know, the, 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 the joint uh, French-German parliamentary assembly that was created by Merkel and Macron in 2019 uh, with members from the Bundestag, members from the Assemblée Nationale, except that right now this parliamentary assembly has absolutely uh, uh, no power, it's purely consultative, but, you know, Germany and France could very well decide to grant to this assembly, you know, the power to uh, have uh, common rules regarding uh, uh, certain aspects of, of uh, climate, uh, fiscal, social, budgetary policy, for instance, the taxation of multinationals, for instance, uh, a, a more equitable system of carbon taxation. And, you know, I think in, in you know, other countries uh, uh, like Italy or Spain or Belgium or other countries will, will, will actually join if, if Germany and France were to propose this. Probably not all 27 countries, but, uh, I, I, you know, I think this is, this is the only way to make progress and then to convince other, other countries to. So I know that, you know, this is not exactly a discussion that you are having right now in the uh, German campaign and, and, and all in France also, it's very difficult to have a sort of concrete uh, conversation in the public debate about how could we change Uh, the, the rules in Europe to have a subset of countries, you know, to, to, to move in this direction. But, you know, that's going to be, that's going to be a very important issue. And, and from my viewpoint, uh, uh, you know, as long as we don't make progress in, in this direction, you know, Europe and including Germany and France, you know, would be, will be very uh, badly treated, you know, in international uh, competition by the US, by China, and, you know, by bigger countries who will be able to sort of divide European countries and in the end get the best deals for their investment, for their multinationals, for their, uh, you know, other commercial business uh, uh, interest. And um, so to me, that's a key priority. Now, who in the German election is more likely to deliver, uh, you know, this kind of, uh, of uh, evolution? Uh, Uh, you know, I don't know. I would say it seems to me from what I, I hear that, you know, the uh, SPD and the Grünen are, are, are 
talking a bit more about uh, 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 you know tax reform in the direction of more equitable taxation and and uh, and, uh, and and and, and uh, you know uh, higher taxation of higher income groups and large corporations and is doing the than the CDU is doing but Again, you know, the, the issue to me is not so much what the government is going to do in Germany or what the government is going to do in France, but really, you know, are we going to be able to change some of the rules of the game in Europe so that we can move together in, in, this, uh, in this direction? You are right. We are not talking a lot about Europe in this election campaign. So that was a good ad for the public debate, I think. Um, back to inequality, there are several questions from the audience who are saying that there is actually a good level of inequality or put forward this argument when you see the top 1% when they're only owning 1% of the wealth. That's too little, because especially in Germany, in the top 1%, you will find a lot of family entrepreneurs who are whose wealth is tied to the company and which is producing goods, paying taxes, creating jobs. So the argument is you need like a little bit or a fair amount of inequality to be a successful nation, to have a successful economy. So are you overshooting with your call for less inequality? Oh, but I didn't call for a reduction of the top 1% share to 1%. Uh, so, you know, if the question was, uh, should we go to, the, you know, to 1% and perfect equality, uh, my answer is no. You know, I have, I have never proposed anything like this. And, you know, we are so far from this. I, I don't think the main risk today is that uh, we, we, get to, we get to this level. You know, remember the data that I have shown you. You know, the share going to the top 10% right now, you know, in Germany or France, uh, the share of wealth is between 50 and 60%. Uh, so if we, if we were to add complete equality, they should have 10%. You know, we are not at all going in this direction. So here, my, 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 I think the, the, the more modest issue is, okay, today, the bottom 50% has, uh, you know, say around 5% of the wealth in, in Germany or in France. You know, in the 19th century, it was two uh, percent. Uh, so you know, it's a, it's an it's a progress, but you know, it's very small for 50 percent of the population. Uh, is it possible? Is this the best we can do? So that's my, my question I'm asking. You know, do we believe this is the, the, the you know, if we if we try to move away from that, uh, is that going to be too much equality? And you know, this is we should stick to this. And frankly. Uh, I, I'm not convinced by that. You know, I think 5% for the bottom 50% of the population is really very small. You know, it really means, you know, an enormous uh, level of concentration of wealth. Well, it means, you know, that you have vast segment of the population who, who uh, you know, don't, don't, basically don't, don't own anything. And, and uh, you know, if you compare different historical periods, different countries, you know, my, my, my general conclusion is that we could actually have more economic efficiency and more economic prosperity by, by having, uh, you know, a, a bigger share for the bottom uh, 50% group, which doesn't mean that the bottom 50% should have 50%. Uh, so again, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about complete equality, but, you know, right now they have 5%. So between 5 and 50, you know, you have 10, you have 20, which would already be an enormous uh, change in terms of, uh, of access to wealth. Now, one, of course, one theory will be we should just wait, you know, for wealth to spread, you know, through more uh, market incentives, market competition, more growth, more innovation. And, you know, I understand this uh, statement, you know, it's a very uh, uh, natural and tempting uh, statement. It's just that historically, you know, if I look at my, at my long run evolution, uh, I, you know, we've had growth and market forces for a very long time, and we don't see uh, really this uh, spread of the wealth. Well, we see the spread of the wealth to the so this sort of patrimonial middle class, but, but you know, the, the bottom 50% or even bottom 60%, you know, is not, is not really uh, getting anything. And I think this is a loss of, uh, in the end, of economic dynamism, economic efficiency. So, so my general answer to this question, you know, it's, it's all a matter of degree. You know, we are not talking about complete, complete equality. We are just saying here we start from a situation of, of very large uh, inequality. And, you know, the only method uh, I can propose to try to, uh, 
uh, answer to the, to, the, to the question, you know, what's the right level of equality and equality? You know, the only method I have to propose is, a, is an historical method. You know, I compare different countries, different time period. And, uh, you know, for instance, you know, if you look at the United States, uh, uh, you know, there was a period of time where uh, uh, inequality in the U.S. was much less than what it is today. So, you know, between 19... Uh, 30, 1980, you know, the, the inequality of income and wealth was actually less than in Europe in many ways. And, you know, you had, uh, you know, under Roosevelt uh, and, you know, an average between 1930, 1980, uh, you had uh, uh, over 80% uh, top marginal tax rate and very high income. There was a, a strong compression of income gaps and wealth gap. And, uh, you know, this did not destroy American capitalism, obviously, otherwise we would have noticed it. But in fact, this was the, the period of maximum economic prosperity of the United States and sort of dominance of the world economy. Why is it so? Well, because my interpretation, you know, looking at the data is that, you know, income gaps or wealth gaps of one to five or one to 10, you know, are useful in terms of incentives, but income gaps of uh, one to 100 or one to 200, are just not very useful. And, and in the end, what really matters for economic prosperity is, okay, you need some incentives, but you don't need gigantic incentives. And most importantly, you need education and you need relatively broad access you know, to education and human capital. And in the middle of the 20th century, uh, uh, you know, the United States had 80%, 90% tax rate set up by Roosevelt, but they also had an enormous educational advance over uh, the rest of the world. So, you know, in the 1950s, you have a, a 90% of, of, of a cohort going to high school in, in, in the US, whereas at the same time in Germany or France or Japan, you know, it's 20 to 30%. And it took until the 1980s, 1990s for, for Europe and Japan to catch up in, with the US, both in terms of uh, education and in terms of productivity. So the general lesson from, from you know, the historical evidence I have tried to put together on inequality, uh, growth, productivity, education, etc., is that, okay, some you need some incentives, obviously, but, but you don't need gigantic financial incentives and you need equality uh, uh, in education and also in, in access, you know, to economic opportunities and, you know, uh, participation to economic decision making, if you want, uh, 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 you know, prosperity. There are several questions about real estate as a driver of inequality. What are you thinking or what is your data saying about real estate and how are you thinking about this topic that the have ones have homes and the have nots are renters, for example? Right, so, you know, there's a, in the long run, uh, you know, we've seen a big increase in real estate price as compared to, you know, the, in the, in the post-war period in the 50s, 60s, 70s, real estate prices were historically uh, relatively low for a number of reasons, including, uh, uh, you know, public construction, rent control, and, and, and a number of, of factors. In, since the 1980s, 1990s, you have a, a very large increase in, in relative real estate price. You also have a, a big increase in the importance of uh, family transmission of wealth, you know, in, 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 in buying real estate. So to some extent, you know, this is a return to a sort of uh, new normal, if you want, in the sense that, uh, you know, before World War I, you know, the transmission of wealth were also very important in, uh, in you know, to determine you know, who was able to, to, to access uh, real estate and who was able to, to, to accumulate wealth in general. And in the post-war period, it was a very special and different period because, you know, so much had been destroyed and so, so many people had been ruined, and especially among the elderly, that, uh, you know, there was little to inherit in 1950 or 1960 or even 1970, you know, in France or Germany, you know, as compared to 1910. So, so it looked this looked like a more meritocratic society and in a way it was a more meritocratic society than ever before or than today but that was partly you know sort of a transitory uh, illusion due to a, a, a huge drama which was world war one world war two and in gigantic destruction of wealth and people and and you know so this was not something uh, 
very positive in itself. This was largely the consequence of, of, uh, uh, of terrible, uh, ter terrible uh, evolutions that took place in the decades before. So now, is there a more peaceful way you know, to have a more equal access to, to wealth and a, a, a smaller uh, role for, uh, for family transmission of wealth? Well, you know, I'm trying to think about that, you know, through the, the redistribution of inheritance. You know, I have made this proposal that, uh, you know, we should think in the long run about the possibility that, uh, uh, you know, everybody uh, at age 25 should inherit a minimum amount. And so, you know, I made a specific proposal, you know, uh, everybody at age 25 uh, should have uh, uh, 120,000 euros, which uh, will be about 60% of average wealth per adult. And so people who today receive zero would receive 120, and people who today receive uh, 1 million uh, would receive uh, 600,000, you know, in the specific proposal I have made. You know, so that we will still be very far from uh, from equality of opportunity because you still have some people with 120,000, some people with 600, and some people with millions. So, if you want my opinion, uh, you know, I think we could go uh, further than this. But already, you know, something like this, you know, that's not going to happen next week. You know, I think it's a, it's an enormous uh, transformation. And and let me say that uh, uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not particularly advising politicians, you know, to put this on the table right away. You know, I think there are many other uh, policy reforms, uh, you know, including uh, the basic income scheme and to improve the working of minimum income system. Uh, uh, you know, there are discussion about job guarantee schemes. There are uh, lots of uh, things to do regarding education policy, educational investment. So I, I would not put this. Uh, redistribution of inheritance necessary at the very top of the list. But if we, if we look in the long run, and if we think about the whole set of policy tools that in the long run could deliver um, more equal and at the same time more prosperous, more mobile, uh, more inclusive society, then uh, you know, I think that, that that would be part of the solution. You know, again, uh, 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 you know, wealth is good, but uh, it's so good that you want everybody to, to you know, to participate to, to wealth accumulation and access to, uh, to, to, to private, uh, private property. And, and otherwise, you know, you have this enormous uh, inequalities, in particular in access to housing. I mean, then, of course, and, and I will stop there, uh, you know, there are other more specific, I sort of gave you a very general answer about access to wealth and access to housing, but of course, there are some much more specific policies uh, regarding housing uh, supply, which can be uh, very important, which I, you know, I know less well in the case of Germany than in the case of France, but, you know, I think there are uh, uh, issues about, uh, you know, public construction of, uh, of housing, uh, uh, social housing, which in some cases could be, uh, uh, improved and you know we you know the, if we don't if we don't uh, if we don't uh, if we, in some cases if we if we don't do what's necessary to change some of the regulations so as to build more housing uh, uh, you know that's going to be difficult to to uh, to lower uh, to lower the to lower the price so there are you know there there are uh, different you know series of policy tools uh, to be considered for a full answer to your to your question obviously. Irene Wagner is saying that she knows a lot of people in the top 10% who want less inequality, but they also don't really trust the politicians that they will spend additional money wisely. Are you putting too much hope into politicians that they will spend the billions you want to tax wisely? You know, I think I, I believe in uh, social security funds in general. So I believe that sometimes, you know, it's important that people know explicitly how the money is, is being, you know, earmarked or transferred to a specific policy, policy fund. So if you think of, you know, pension fund or, or health insurance or, you know, other uh, social security funds, one of the reasons why it has been quite successful, you know, in the long run and why it has remained in place uh, after it was set up is because, you know, the social contribution or tax revenue that is being targeted to this fund, you know, has to be spent for this uh, specific purpose to, to, to a large extent, which makes it very, which 
helps to build uh, trust in the system and also makes it very difficult for you know politicians to cut the resources uh, that you have in this fund because if you cut the resources then you have to explain which pension are going to be cut which uh, else spending are going to be cut and that's very difficult and i think uh, uh, I'm, I'm not saying we should do the same for every piece of public spending you know there is of course some need for some something like a general budget that can be adjusted year to year but maybe we should do it for more uh, categories of spending you know uh, including uh, higher education or you know education in general if if you think of the inheritance for all uh, systems that i was describing you know i think that if the proceed from uh, inheritance taxation or wealth taxation because in my proposal it's both the inheritance taxation and the annual wealth tax that is being used to pay for uh, inheritance for all if 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 this tax revenue were put in a fund that was paying inheritance for all for everybody at age 25 then it will make it quite difficult you know to reduce uh, the tax that uh, that is uh, <laughs> that that is paying for this fund because then you would need to explain uh, you know uh, who's going to lose from from, from that so uh, so you know, I, I mean, generally speaking, we need more uh, uh, sort of you know citizen involvement in in the sort of understanding of the of the tax system, the, the budget, the inequality, and you know, I'm, I'm trying with the world inequality database, you know, to raise uh, transparency and sort of public awareness and public knowledge about uh, you know who's uh, who's uh, who's making what income, who's earning what wealth, but. There's a lot more that needs to be done. If citizens don't have a clear understanding of what's being done with their, with their money and with their spending, then indeed, you know, this uh, uh, problem of, of trust uh, that you describe will arise. Let me simply end with an optimistic note, which is that in the long run, you know, I have shown you the graph on the rise of the social state in Europe. Uh, you know, there's been a huge rise in, in the fraction of national income that we decide to put together. You know, it was less than 10% of national income uh, in the 19th century and before World War I. It is today between 40 and 50% of national income all across Western Europe. And, you know, no politician is proposing to go back to, you know, below 10% uh, before World War I. And nobody would ever propose that because by and large, you know, this has been a big success. Then the, the question is, do we, do we stay there? Or do we, you know, is it possible to think of a new new step in the, in, the, in, in, in the rise of social state? And I think this will come only if there is a new step in progressive taxation of uh, high income, high wealth, because, you know, no, nobody in the middle class or in the lower middle class wants to pay more with the current tax system where the very rich are escaping taxation. You know, so that's not going to work. So you need to have a major uh, change in the direction of progressive taxation if you want a new step. And you need to have what you mentioned, which is more sort of citizen involvement in, uh, in, in the way the money is being spent. So I think, uh, uh, you know, that doesn't need to be a top-down uh, system from a central government. You, know, you, you want to, to involve uh, through uh, some form of uh, funds and, and local uh, uh, monitoring of the spending, and, and otherwise there will be no new uh, step in this direction. If you are arguing, arguing for a bigger social state than 50% or 45% that we have at the moment, how far would you go? Because I think many people in Germany would also argue that 50% is kind of a maximum level that you shouldn't overstep because also in the end, that means that the redistribution that is needed to push the social state above this level means that you have to tax the average dollar or the average euro actually by more than 50% to reach 75% of redistribution. So how far do you want to go there? You know, what's important is to try to have a sort of rational, historical question, uh, discussion on this question and to avoid sort of religious uh, conception, uh, you know, saying, okay, 50% is a religious upper bound or whatever. Because what we know from history, like, you know, I was talking about the US under Roosevelt, is that, you know, between 1930 and 1980, on average, the top income tax rate on very high income was 81% on average. And, you know, this was only at the federal level. There was also state income tax, which put an additional 10 or 15 percent. 
And, and you know, this, uh, this, again, this did not destroy American capitalism. If anything, this was the period of maximum prosperity. Now, that doesn't mean that we want the same tax rate for the full population. And of course, this was the tax rate at the very top. But already, you know, that's something to take into account because sometimes when people say 50% is the absolute maximum, they also say that for, at the very top, which to me is a statement that makes no sense in light of historical experience you know and and uh, so I, you know i'm not saying i have perfect historical data but all the historical data i have suggests that you know this experience this big historical experience in particular in the united states between 1930 1980 was was a was a big success historically uh, we can do even better we can organize it better but you know i think this uh, the, the view that uh, if 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 uh, if the tax rate on anyone is higher than 50%, then the economy collapses, you know, it's, it's just wrong if you just look at the basic evidence uh, of the 20th uh, century. So this is my, uh, you know, first, first answer. Second answer, if we think, if we forget about the very top income and look at the, the national income in general and the, the level of socialization for the entire economy, I, I can see, of course, the argument that 50% is already a lot in terms of total tax revenue and that we want to, to stop there because otherwise, you know, we're going to go to 60, 70, 80. I, I can see this argument. The only problem with this argument is that uh, we know also that there are entire sectors of the economy, in particular education and health, you know, which are going to grow a lot in the coming decades and which, in fact, uh, do not work very well uh, if you organize them on a purely, uh, you know, for-profit basis. You know, if you, if you think of countries that, that, that have used, uh, you know, only private hospitals, private insurance companies in the health sector in the U.S., at the end of the day, it's not only very unequal, it's also very inefficient. You know, they spend a lot of resources much more resources than, than in European public system with absolutely, uh, uh, you know, terrible outcomes in terms of public health. This is the same for education. You know, in, in education, uh, uh, you don't, nobody wants to have a for-profit uh, shareholder company. Well, there was some attempt, you know, there was the Trump University, which was a for-profit shareholder university. It was a complete disaster. Now, why was it a complete disaster? That's an interesting question. Well, it's because... There are large sectors, including education and health, where the profit motive, in fact, is killing some of the sort of uh, ethical behavior and sort of value-oriented behavior that is at the core of teaching and to some extent health care. And, and this is true also, in, by the way, in other sectors, you know, in, the, in culture, in the media, to, you know, to some extent. You know, energy, transportation, you know, it's, it's more complicated, but, but, you know, the profit motive by and large is not always uh, 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 very, um, very efficient. And these sectors that I have just described, you know, uh, health, education, culture, you know, are going to be much more important sectors in the 21st century than the automobile sector. I mean, they are already much more important than the automobile sector, you know, including in Germany with a big automobile sector. But in the coming decades, uh, you know, so this has not, so if we if from the beginning we don't want to put more uh, public resources into these sectors, uh, so what are we going to do? Are we going to have more uh, uh, you know for profit uh, companies uh, in health, education, uh, culture? You know, we really have need to think more. Now, if we put more public resources, again, that doesn't mean that we're going to have a top down approach with you know the central government uh, deciding everything. You know, I believe in uh, autonomous uh, universities to have uh, you know we need to design decentralized way to to organize all of this. Uh, you know, in the health sector, we we have very different system. You know, for instance, you know I don't know in. Uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in France, there's a relatively decentralized system with doctors uh, as compared to Britain, for instance, where doctors, uh, it's a much more centralized pay system. I, I mean, you, you, there are many different ways to organize uh, uh, this sector, so have to have the right level of decentralization and competition. And at the same time, you know, some, some public resources and some logic of economic organization that is not entirely driven by... Uh, by a, by, a, by a profit motive. So, 
where are we going to be in the long run in terms of um, you know total share of national income that is not driven by a profit motive um, uh, you know i don't know but i i would say the real question is is this working you know what's working in education health uh, culture uh, the environment uh, energy transportation and you know my guess is that you know the profit motive is is working for some segments of the economy but but in the long run probably not the majority of the economy can, can i throw in a question about education funding because you also emphasize this in your talk and i think rightly so uh, what do you think about charging people without privatizing uh, charging people for access to university so because currently as you said you know the rich and educated are sending their children to university and this is paid for by people who don't attend university because they never reach it so there's the idea that okay depending on your income if your income is low you don't pay but um, if your income is higher would you uh, be in favor of uh, charging some money some fees for uh, uh, people who are well off and attend university to finance the education for the poorer well i i, I am in favor of you know uh, rich parents you know to pay um, to pay um, more uh, you know income tax uh, and wealth tax uh, you know to pay for the higher education of everybody you know, not only of their children but also of the poor but, but why not pay i mean then you you have distortion as you know of course. distortions as you know of course but if you charge directly should the, if you charge the children for attending university there is no distortion right it's just a fee you pay for it if you don't pay it you don't get it you know, I, again, the model of distortion for education to me is not fully convincing because this is sort of assuming that, you know, there is a market equilibrium for education that's sort of delivering the efficient outcome. And then, then any system of public provision of education uh, runs into the difficulty of creating a distortion. I mean, I know the theoretical models that you have in mind in terms of uh, mathematical equation, I can see them very well. But historically, I don't think this is the way uh, things have developed. You know, the way things have developed is that education uh, uh, has developed uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a public or non-profit uh, system with a very different system of incentives than the one you're describing, and, and it has worked pretty well. And so I'm a bit concerned that, you know, this system in practice of sort of paying for your own higher education, you know, in effect, the rich, rich parents are going to, give the money to their children so that they can pay for the tuition and and so from the point of view of rich parents you know i can see that this is a better system and a less distorted system if you want than paying for all children but um, you know in terms of collective uh, collective efficiency you know i I don't, you know, I think Germany, part of, of uh, what's working uh, uh, in, in Germany or Sweden, and I think what's working in, in many ways better than in France and, and better than in the US and the UK has been that uh, higher education has been uh, uh, free, uh, you know, by and large, and uh, relatively equal, or at least less heavily uh, stratified than either in France within the very stratified public system or uh, within the very stratified private public system in US or, or UK. So, uh, so before moving away from there, uh, you know, I will think twice about it. And, uh, I, you know, I would prefer France to, to, to copy Germany and Sweden in this respect rather than Germany copy uh, France or the US or uh, actually more the US and France in that respect. And, uh, but then it raises the issue of public resources. And that's why we're back to the discussion about, uh, you know, tax justice, uh, tax progressivity. Um, but we have to, to face that, to confront that. Thanks a lot for your time. We are already one minute over the clock, uh, but that was a very interesting discussion uh, in the end. Uh, thanks a lot for your okay. slides, for your historical perspective, and for all the arguments put forward to our audience. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your invitation. Thank you, Thomas. It's great. It's great. And 
On October 11th, the next Munich economic debates will take place actually with uh, Clemens Hust himself and with his tax proposals for the new government. And I'm really looking forward how many inheritance and wealth tax are. Uh, okay. yeah. You have to keep me posted about this. Yeah. I will. <laughs> okay. I will. I will. But thanks, you know, I will talk, of course, talk about tax justice and also about health and income tax. So, okay. But for today, thank you very much, Thomas. It was wonderful, very inspiring. Okay. And uh, to you, Bastian, and to everybody. And see you next time. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.